Hi there. We were really unhappy with John Quincy when he was on a radio interview with uh, Mason Lee, and I don't remember who was there, John Bryan was there. He called in and said, it's two great radio stations and I never worked at either one of them. So we contacted a couple of program directors who said they would gladly hire John. And so we have a, we have something, uh, we'll let Mason Dixon stand in for Terrell McVinney, Mitch Michael. In that perfect Mason Lee Dixon for Mitch Michael. God. There he is, boy. All right. We'll have to give Mitch some drugs. <laughs> Except for the fickle figure of fate, Ted Tatman might have been born and raised in or near Louisville a few years earlier than he was, and he would have been able to listen to and love, quote, one of America's great radio stations, end quote, during his formative years. Except for the fickle finger of fate, young Ted, now known as John Quincy, might have awakened mornings listening to the unique voice and humor of not only Louisville's greatest, but America's greatest morning radio personality whose ride didn't pick him up tonight, the Duke of Louisville, Bill Bailey, on Radio WKLO. Young Ted would have skipped school to be exposed to the genius of the Chucker, Chuck Browning who could express the most feeling with the fewest words of any air personality ever to make love to listeners through the airwaves. Sure, that's what they all say. No doubt, Ted would have hung on every word and phrase from other magnificent air personalities who made Radio WKLO great. Lee Gray, Carl Truman Wigglesworth, Charlie Knox, quote, Rickshaw, unquote, Wild Willie, Jim Fletcher, Jack Sorby, Jack Gallo, John Fantini Gray, Dale Reeves, Bill Clark, Jim Schneider, John Rode, and Al Risen. Anybody? All stand. <laughs> to prepare for news radio that was yet to come, young Theodore would have been exposed to the radio journalistic expertise of Alan Bryan, Bones Henry, John Sharp, Reed Yaden, Ken Knight, Jack Thurston, J. Paul Roberts, and Tom Maxidon. If he was a good contest player, he might have won a seat on the 1965 Beatle bus to Chicago, hosted by Englishman Ken Douglas, who teamed with the then young and later legendary <coughs> Johnny Randolph. Come on! My God! <laughs> yes. And young Kevin Matheny, as they foresaw and dreamed of their future in radio. It's difficult to even imagine how the life of John Quincy might have turned out had he been able to experience the valuable influence of Radio WKLO instead of being forced to listen to that other station. Which, and I'm having to read this, that psychiatric experts might classify as extreme child abuse and today would more than likely be forbidden as inhuman torture for captured Taliban terrorists. <laughs> I, I hope his uh, memos weren't as long as this thing is. <laughs> we live in a world of uh, woulda, coulda, shouldas, and nothing can really change what has already been inflicted on young Ted. But perhaps in a very small way, those of us who were honored to be part of the Radio WKLO team of the 60s and 70s can share just a bit of that inestimable honor and joy by adopting John Quincy into our radio family as the first honorary Radio WKLO personality. <laughs> on behalf of the WKLO greats mentioned above, along with others who were heard on WKLO and those behind the scenes that made it possible with our beloved leaders, General Manager Ernie Guthridge, Bernie Thompson, Charles Sawyer, welcome John, welcome to the Radio WKLO family. And thank you for keeping alive the memory of WKLO and Wacky, two great radio stations, each made even greater by the competition of the other. Signed, God bless, Terrell Matheny, The Mighty Mitch. Okay, so Johnny Randolph will stand in for Johnny Randolph. <laughs> Notice how he glides. How he glides, man. Given the length of that memo, after you hear Johnny Randolph, you're going to realize why he's a hero. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, my old thing always was, now, make it like a reader's digest and say a lot in just a few words. <laughs> That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, 
uh, Mason said this, but Gerald Matheny had his knee replaced. Good. So uh, he came in here. <coughs> right now he was on drugs when he wrote That's right. <laughs> okay. This is short. It was a time and a place in global radio history. It was a battle between WHAY and WKLO. During this time, dozens of DJs made their way something special. And I lost my place. <laughs> there there have been 15 air personalities from that era who have moved on to positions in the top 10 markets in the United States. This is a record for a city the size of Louisville, it really is. There's one person who never worked in Louisville Radio, never lived in Louisville. In fact, he hasn't lived in Kentucky since 1981. Growing up in Lexington, he became a true fan of the Louisville Radio scene. And through his tireless efforts, he's keeping WAKY and WKLO alive via the internet. There can only be one honorary wacky DJ, and I, along with my colleagues, proclaim that to be John Quincy. Yeah. Mike, Mike Griffin had the idea, by the way. Well, actually, Mason wasn't too happy after that WFPL broadcast either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, we're going to do a couple of things here. We've got this letter, there's a big empty space at the bottom. We're going to ask everyone in the room that worked at either station to sign it. It uh, is going to go under the letterhead of both stations together. That's a first. That's a first. <laughs> <laughs> and sign at the bottom. Hopefully we'll get you all on one page. Just kind of bear in mind we'd like to do that. But if not, I've got more paper. And the other thing that we have, we're going to frame it and send it back to it. He doesn't have to get that today. Get to frame this jacket here? Well, he the <laughs> wow. So we thought he should have an honorary hey, jacket. And that's a first. <laughs> okay, we're going to the tail on number one. And on the front, John Quincy staff. In All right. All right. All right. Stop by and sign it, and Max will take care of it for us. Does it mean it goes back to what's going on? Yeah, way to go, John. Does it mean it goes back to Mason now? No, no, I don't. No? Gary, 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 Gary Burbank here. Can we all please really give him the clap now? <laughs> you, you, you know, it's the 5,826 time I heard that fucking joke. <laughs> Pardon me, but we can do that here again. We were not on TV, right? Oh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about Johnny, I guess, uh, as we get to it. I'm not even sure what the award is, but I'll figure something out as we get to it. Uh, Ted, let me know. Uh, there, there are a couple of people in the room. Oh, when we talk about Wacky, I'm not sure about KLO, I was never there, but I, I heard everybody there, and I'll tell you one thing, when I first came to town and heard WKLO, I thought to myself, and that's going to be a tough nut to crack, that's a hell of a radio station. And uh, I was hired by Bob Todd, and uh, I'll tell you, Bob was, was just amazing, Al, Bob, I think, uh, Bob and Al, can you guys stand up, these are the guys who actually started this whole thing, there's Bob over there, and Al Smith, I mean these guys, yeah. <laughs> They got me, I was in Memphis, Tennessee at Plow Incorporated. Anybody ever worked for Plow? <laughs> then, you, then you know. I, I used to have to go stand in the bathroom waiting for my shift to end as far as my production shift after I did my show. And uh, Bob Todd and uh, Dude Walker came to town and said, you want to come to Wacky? And I thought, yeah, because, you know, I'm standing in here and I'm listening to people, you know, get out of here. So when I, when I tell the manager, I said, you know, I'm going to Wacky, he says, you know, Gary, that's the asshole of the world. <laughs> I said, man, I've been hearing the assholes of the world at WMPS in Memphis. I want to go see them. <laughs> so I came up, and I'll tell you, I couldn't believe the way these guys treated radio personalities. They acted like, actually, we were real people. We weren't people to hide away. And uh, it was a fun thing to get into. And then I meet these guys, and then uh, I'll give you a little hint as to how John, Johnny got his job, as, as, as at least the... Uh, 
And there may be some disputes on how this happened, but I was there. Mason Lee knows it. I know it. Bob Dooney, Looney's heard the story, you know, many times, so he knows that I never lie. <laughs> there was a uh, Johnny Randolph. Uh, Bob Todd left. I think he was pregnant, and he went out. And Bob Todd leaves, and so he's looking for another program director. We knew we had a great radio station. We had to have a good radio station to go opposite KLO, right? So uh, Bob leaves. So. The natural idea for us was Johnny Randolph would be the program director because we knew that Johnny wouldn't break what wasn't broken. And uh, of course, Al wasn't sure, too sure about that. He's the same guy that when uh, Johnny Walker, the greatest disc jockey that was ever at in Baltimore, came to Al Smith and said, I want to do mornings. I heard the story today. Al said, you'll never make it in radio <laughs> in the morning. Get out. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so, so Johnny, uh, we're pushing, remember that meeting in the, in, in the, uh, in the is we're pushing for Johnny to be the program director, and Al's just kind of, I don't know, so I remember standing up and saying, tell you what, I'm headed to Coots's, I'm going to sit over there until Johnny Randolph is a PD in the station, I'm going to sit there if it takes me a year or two. Of course, basically, he's ready to join any rebellion, he didn't know what the hell I was even talking about. Basically, jumps up, by God, I'm with you. <laughs> and everybody else, we go over to the station. Al is kind of like, you assholes. <laughs> so we go over, and we're waiting for, as we were talking about, the white smoke to go up. You know, let us know who was the program director of Wacky. And every time a salesman would walk in, I'm not sure who was there with us, but it was like, hey, you guys, get us a drink, goddammit. <laughs> they buy us a drink at Coons and Dutchman, right now from Wacky. Probably the white smoke did go up, and uh, Johnny Randolph. Uh, was the program director of the station. And it was the most brilliant move that Al Smith ever made. And uh, so as Johnny comes in, we didn't know exactly how, what kind of a program director Johnny would be. We, we knew he would be okay, not, not push us too hard. But he knew about all of the egos on the station. And you know, it takes a great PD, great PD to know that and not to, you know, come in and say, here's what we're going to do now, new format, everybody starts saying, uh, uh, Miss e. Alvin Davis. <laughs> you know, so, but E. Alvin's fine where he is. But if e. if e. Alvin had come into Wacky, you know, that kind of a PD doing his own thing, he would have died. So Johnny knew what to do. Uh, uh, for instance, Lynn King. You just try to crack up Lynn King on the air. Now, how far can you go with Johnny? I didn't know. And I mean, how crazy can we be? And I. Uh, I'm walking by, Lynn's about to do the news, we're always trying to get Lynn, I walked by, I had a big, good hopper up here, and I looked at the news window, and I go, <laughs> and it was beautiful, <laughs> and it starts, down the window, and Lynn looks at me, and goes, yeah, it is, okay, you're next. It's still so, there. Uh, I, <laughs> it's still, we saw it today, by the way, it's still there, the hopper's still there. It's a nail, it really was. So, so Lynn, I, he, you know, after the newscast, I'll play a record, and just as I come back from the break of the record, Lynn runs in the control room and he lays a napkin with a turd in it. And so I'm like, that was, oh, turd, lady, now, hey. Because <laughs> you couldn't say turd back in there. It's a man now, by the way. So, so uh, during the next record, I grabbed the turd in the napkin and I ran back to Randolph's office and I laid it on his desk. He was, Randolph was having a conference with someone. Oh, it was a priest. I, I had no idea he didn't have a collar on him. You know? So I said, hey man, your lunch is here. Bam! And, and we, we run out. So Randolph just looks at me and I think, okay, I'll, I'll go back to Lynn. I guess I'll probably have to look for a job now. That was pretty stupid. Randolph comes out laughing like hell. The priest wasn't. You know, it was okay. So we kind of knew that Johnny was the kind of guy. He was one of us. He always was one of us. And I think that's what it took for him to be the program director that he became. He knew not to break it, he knew how to handle every single person in that station and get the very, very best out of that guy by not hassling him as long as it wasn't Mason Lee. Of course, you gotta hassle has Mason Lee, he's kind of guy. You know, every now and then put him in stocks and everybody else come by and whoop up on him with a chain. But Johnny was absolutely, and I gotta say, I worked for a lot of PD, he's one of the finest, I mean, absolute best friends I ever had. I, we can tell stories later about things that we did with Johnny. But he was absolutely the finest man as a program director I ever, ever worked for. And I am so proud. And I learned so much working for this guy. Johnny Randolph, this award is yours. And what can I say to him? Here. Come on up. Come on, you
Ladies and gentlemen, here comes Travis. Garbage bag. Oh my God. Wow. No. Wait, wait, wait. The station student came alone when we came. That's where his radio was. <laughs> we had to do a competition, man. You guys were hot. I don't know what to say. A guy on radio that doesn't know what to say.